Ben Steele has a new book out called The Battle of Bretton Woods. And with all the talk about a currency war going on right now, it's more timely than ever. He's here to talk about it. Welcome, Ben. Thanks for having me, Greg. Now, why was the so-called Battle of Bretton Woods one of the United States' most important victories during the Second World War? Well, the um, Bretton Woods Conference in 1944 was actually the most important international gathering since the Paris Peace Conference in 1919. Forty-four nations were represented, but this was really a battle between two countries, the United States and Great Britain. Um, the U.S. was trying to take advantage of the fact that Britain was going bankrupt during World War II to reorder uh, the economic hierarchy after the war. And we offered the British a really tough deal. We said, we'll give you financial aid just to get you through the war, but in return for which you're going to give us three things. You're going to get rid of imperial trade preference, by which Britain uh, got privileged access to its uh, col um, colonies and dominions. You were going to make the pound sterling fully convertible at a fixed exchange rate, and that was going to bankrupt the British Treasury. And finally, you're going to accept the U.S. dollar as the global unit of account after the war, and the British were none too happy about this. And our so-called general during the Battle of Bretton Woods was a, let's call him a bureaucrat named Harry White. So who was Harry White? Harry Dexter White's fascinating character came up from the bowels, as it were, of the U.S. Treasury Department, relatively obscure character for most of his career there. He was paid out of the profits of the Exchange Stabilization Fund. But this was a man who was absolutely determined even eight years before the, the conference, um, uh, to have a conference that would set up the U.S. dollar as the global unit of account and knock the pound sterling off its throne. And his adversary in this battle, between allies really, because the war was still raging, was John Maynard Keynes, who is well known to be one of the great economists in history. How did Harry White outmaneuver John Maynard Keynes? Well, Harry Dexter White was um, a great admirer of Keynes, um, but he was absolutely determined to best him at Bretton Woods, and he used remarkable ruses uh, to get by Keynes. For example, Keynes wanted to create a new international currency, which would obviously rival the U.S. dollar. Harry Dexter White would have nothing to do with this. But at Bretton Woods, knowing Keynes would not agree to this, he sidelined him, made him in charge of the World Bank Commission, which the U.S. didn't care about, and then used a ruse, had a technical team rewrite the text behind the scenes, replacing the uh, generic term gold convertible currency with the U.S. dollar. Keynes didn't even know what he was signing when he was kicked out of the hotel. So what was the result of the Battle of Bretton Woods? And you know, how did it stand so long? It stood all the way until... President Nixon took us off the gold standard in 1971. That's right. Well, first of all, politically, Britain was bankrupted after the war. The empire collapsed as quickly and as violently as it did because it ran out of dollars and gold. Um, but although many people um, uh, view Bretton Woods have, as having been a very successful uh, creation, it really didn't last that long. It wasn't until 1961 that the first nine European countries um, finally met the convertibility requirements in Bretton Woods, that the currency would be convertible into U.S. dollars. By that time, the U.S. Uh, was already losing gold reserves. In other words, the world was losing confidence in the dollar and starting to say, we want to cash this stuff in for gold. And of course, in, 10 years later, in 1971, Richard Nixon had to close the gold window. So right now, when people are talking about a currency war, because the Japanese are devaluing the yen and to a certain extent, we're doing the same thing here with the dollar and the euro might not even stay together. So what lessons can traders now learn from what happened with Harry White at Bretton Woods? Well, in fact, Harry Dexter, Wood, uh, uh, <laughs> Harry Dexter White announced to the U.S. delegation right before they went into battle at Bretton Woods that the purpose of the new IMF they were setting up was to prevent competitive devaluations against the U.S. dollar, to stop currency wars aimed at the U.S. dollar. But we were able to drive through this deal at Bretton Woods because we held all the cards with the world. The world couldn't do anything except a barter or trade with dollars and gold. Today, China doesn't have the same sort of leverage over the United States that we had over, British, uh, over Britain in the 1940s. So this is probably a world in which we need a new Bretton Woods, but we probably won't be able to achieve one. At some point, will there be a currency war between the yuan and the dollar where we will need another Bretton Woods? You know, you know, I think we're moving in that direction inadvertently. Neither of us wants it. Uh, the U.S. Well, we certainly don't want to be in the British position where there, we're an empire failing, so we will have problems with the dollars because of our own uh, deconstruction, if you will. Uh, that, that's right. 
Um, but we like the current system whereby we send a dollar to China for goods. Immediately, China loans the dollar back to us at almost the zero interest rate. We recycle the dollars through the U.S. financial system, create more credit to buy more Chinese goods. So right now, this is a nice system for us. But what about for them? How well, long will they accept that system before we need to come to a new agreement? The Chinese are in a bind. They know the system is unfair. Um, they're absolutely clear about the fact that it's the U.S. who's at fault for its fiscal profligacy, um, uh, for being reckless with its loose monetary policy, but what can they do? Uh, and their reserves are about $2.6 trillion worth of dollar-denominated assets, and if the U.S. dollar were to cease being the global unit of account, the global purchasing power of that vast hoard of dollars would collapse, so they have no incentive to bring this structure down either. Amazing book, amazing timing for it. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me, Greg. And thank you for watching The Street.